This conference will now be recorded. Hello. Hi, Lali. Hello.
Hello, Rohit. Hello, hi. Hi. You guys? Are... Yeah. Uh, we joined. All right. So shall we start now? Oh, the taxi train. Oh, the taxi train. Oh, the taxi train. Oh, the all right, so shall we start now? Yes, please. <laughs> so last time, uh, in our last part, uh, we have seen that we have created the public instance, we have created the private instance. And then we have jumped public to private, right? But the problem that was we were facing is though we have a private EC2 machine, we cannot configure those private machines. We cannot download any packages, we cannot upload any packages, we cannot communicate that, uh, on that EC2 machine. So, what is the use of having the private machine if we can't configure the thing, right? So, to Override this problem to troubleshoot this problem. We have a concept called VPC NAT. What NAT does is to understand. We need to understand before that how the communication happens between two parties between a sender and receiver. So let's say we both are connected. We all are connected via this go to meeting. So what does this go to meeting does is it uses my IP. It uses your system's IP and then whatever things that I'm talking, whatever the things that I'm sharing, it writes a packet, it writes, it creates a data and then it sends it to you. <clears throat> now, all the people on the internet cannot receive this. Right on internet, there are millions of users who is connected on internet, but to all 1 million or millions of users, this data is not going to this data is not sending this data is only sending to couple of users those who are connected to this go to meeting so there is a particular ips there is particular uh, public ip between you and me those are having transaction the public ip of my and the public ip of your system are having a communication whatever the data i am sending you you are getting on your side that is on the receiver so now this is called as this concept is public IP to public IP. Public IP to public IP transmission of data. Now, when we are on the private EC2 machine, we do not have any public IP. So now this device called as network address transition comes into the picture. What it does is there is a sender who has having a public IP. There is a receiver who do not have private uh, who do not have any public IP who has a private IP. So in between this public IP and private IP, there comes an intermediary server or intermediary device called as NAT that does a public IP job on behalf of your private EC2 machine. Let's assume. This is system one and there goes your system two. The system two has only private and this system one will have also public. So sending a data from public to private, this middleware job is done by the NAT. So NAT act as a public IP for the system two. So public IP will for this system will send the data to the NAT NAT will translate the data from public and send it to the private that is system 2. Similarly, if system 2 wants to upload any data to the internet, so it will upload it to the NAT. Uh, it will send it via NAT and NAT will throw it to the internet. So this is filtering of your internet connection. Only the connection which is requested will be only delivered to the system 2 and system 2 will only able to make a connection. Now, NAT is not only for the sending of data and the receiving of the data. When you have a NAT in middle of your 
system two that is in middle of your private systems at that time any user on the internet any request coming from the internet cannot go to the system two via net also if you me trying to connect directly to the is private ec2 machine via this net we are not allowed to do that and we cannot do that any users on the internet any request on the internet cannot just directly go to your private ec2 machine via this net though the net uh, the, the though the net serve the public ip part still any users on the internet cannot reach to the system 2 via net but system 2 can request any data he wants on the internet if the private ec2 machine wants to have apache server then it can request via net to download the packages of the uh, apache server it will go to that particular server of apache download the package and then install in the system which means that private ec2 machines can make a connection to the internet to get the data but on the other hand internet users or internet requests cannot hit request to the machine so it's like one way communication only ec2 instance can request for the data can upload for the data can download the data but on the other users the, the internet requests that are coming cannot head to the your private machine so this is a job done by the net this is like one way communication all right a net device is used to enable instances in private submit to connect internet yes yeah one question uh, Lalit, uh, is this not like how we are going to uh, uh, establish the connection between the uh, host machine and the uh, virtual machine in the, in the pc yeah yeah we will see that lab session we'll see that no no i'm just asking the question here uh, are we uh, are we doing the same in the ec2 instance yes 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 we in the same ec2 instance Okay. All right. So a net device is used to enable instances in private subnet to connect to the internet, but it also prevents the internet from initiating connection with the instance. So internet request and internet request will not go to the EC2 machine, but EC2 machine can initiate any connections he want. So it's like a one-way communication. When traffic goes to the internet. Uh, that's what I have explained. The IP4 address is translated to the NAT address and the NAT address privately sends the data to the EC2 machine and similarly vice versa. Now there are two types of NAT devices, a NAT gateway and NAT instance. A NAT instance is just like an EC2 machine on which a NAT uh, you know, device, a NAT configuration is already configured. Whereas a NAT gateway is an Amazon managed services. So on the NAT instance, you need to create an EC2 machine. You need to maintain that EC2 machine and you need to configure everything that requires to have a private communications on your private EC2 machine. Whereas when you have an Amazon managed NAT gateway, you don't need to manage anything. You don't need to create any EC2 machine. You don't need to create any uh, you know NAT uh, part. You don't need to configure that. You don't need to do anything. Everything is taken care by the AWS. So these are the two NAT devices. We'll see uh, the base. Basically, the functioning of both the devices are same. They uh, give the same performance and the same uh, the way of communicating to the internet. The only difference is how you going to maintain these servers. When you go for a NAT machine, you need to manage all these things. When you go for a NAT gateway, Amazon will manage it for you. So NAT gateway, you can use NAT gateway to enable instances in private to connect to the internet, but it also prevents the internet from initiating the request, just like your NAT. Now here you are charged for creating a NAT gateway in your account. NAT is not uh, free tier eligible. You will get charged for using a NAT service. 
and net gateway is uh, basically on hourly charges the number of hours you use you will get charged for that as net gateway is an amazon managed services so it offers you automatic scaling of your net gateway when you have a small uh, you know a small request number of requests at that time 5 gpps of bandwidth minimum bandwidth you get and if you are having a heavy load of traffic at that time it will automatically scale and meet the 45 gpps of bandwidth so this is the uh, best part of a net gateway from 5 gpps to 45 gpps it will automatically scale whereas when you talk about the net instance net instance needs to be managed by the customer which means at any moment if you have a heavy load on your backend instances or private to instances at that time you need to make sure that you have auto scaling features already enabled on your NAT instances so when you are going for a NAT instances you need to configure the NAT part you need to configure the load balancer you need to configure the auto scaling and everything but when it comes to the NAT gateway all these things are done by the AWS you just give a connection to your private EC2 machine. All right. So it's highly recommended that you should go for a NAT gateway, not the NAT instance. But then it's up to you. Based on your scenario, you can change and move to the NAT instances as well. As well. Any question, any doubt in this NAT part? Or we'll just move to the lab session. We'll see how to do this. Any any question in doubt? No, Lali. All right. So as we already know that we have private EC2 machine and we have public EC2 machine. Public have an internet connection, whereas the private do not have any internet connection and if i go to my vpc section in the route tables then my public route table is having an internet gateway 0.0.0.0 whereas in the private route table we do not have anything correct now before we go there is one thing that you need to always remember which is very important part nat is always created in public subnet and then get associated to private EC2 machine or private subnet. You need to always create a NAT in public subnet and then connect to the private subnet. Why? Because our internet gateway is connected to the public subnet. So it will take the internet from the public subnet and then filter it and provide it to your private subnet. So that's why it's always recommended or it's always mandatory to always create a NAT gateway or NAT instance in public subnet and then associate it to private subnet. So from the left hand side, there is a NAT gateway available. You can just click on NAT gateway. Create NAT gateway, give a name. Now is here is asking for the subnet. So as we know that our subnet 01 is a public subnet and submit 02 is a private submit so i will select the public submit 01 and here it's asking for the elastic ip and we do not have any elastic ip as of now we haven't created so there is a dire option available to create an elastic ip so here you create elastic ip and then click on create a net gateway so now net gateway has been successfully created but it will take time to create it's under pending state Again, going back to the route tables, then clicking on the private VPC, uh, route table, private route table. And in the route section, we'll do edit, add a route. And this time we will add 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 slash 0. And target will be our NAT gateway, the one which we have just created. I click on save routes. That's all you need to do. Now what you need to do is, so it will take few seconds now to connect to the NAT. It's under pending. 
if you want to create a net instance you can just click on launch instance just the way that you do in our normal ec2 machine click on community ami and here search for net so these are net enable ec2 machine you can just click on select this whatever the ec2 instance you can select the configuration type and you can create an ec2 machine in your public subnet and once you do you need to just go to the routing section again and provide the ip address of your ec2 machine of your nat gateway that's all so now i'll just connect to my bastion server first of all And this is not connecting. Okay, we are connected now to our Amazon Linux to AMI, which is 0 0.201. That is our public EC2 machine. Now we do sudo so and we already have that key SSH iPhone I and the private IP address of our private EC2 machine and we are connected to our private 1.139 Previously, it was 0 0.209. So, before that, we do not have any uh, internet connection, but let's test. This time, we must have internet connection. And we are receiving data. So, this private EC2 instance is still private, and still we are getting the data. We are connected to the internet. And if you try to hit the and if you try to hit the request from the internet to this EC2 machine, you won't be able to do that. If I want to update my packages, yeah, I'm update. It's checking all the updates. Yes, download, download and updating. So this is how you can update your private infrastructure. Now, even if you have hundreds of servers in your private infrastructure doesn't matter correct so i have no doubt we have a bastion server we have a private ec2 machine a bastion server is only used to jump to a private ec2 machine correct let's say i have installed apache server on my ec2 machine which i want to and i want to upload my entire website on this site but this site doesn't have any public ip so how users will access to my ec2 machine on port 80 did you get the scenario there is a passion server there is a private machine passion is only used to connect to a private machine Whereas under my private machine, my website is running, Apache server and a certain website is running. But this website doesn't have any public IP. So how a user can access via a browser on port HTTP? On uh, VPC group, you can allow uh, for this uh, private IP port 80. Security group? VPC, uh, yeah. So here I just need to enable the port 80, correct? Yeah. Let's do that. HTTP is open to the world. And then let's just download the Apache server. But 
it is service http start now watch till we do not have any public ip how to access the data from the browser we do not have still any public ip so Matting gateway application. No, application. No. See, one is inbound the name, but no, the outbound server. Public IP of the back. Public IP? So we have to mat. You, you can mat it, right? Uh, how? Hello? Hello. Yes, yes, how? Uh, you have to match this with the public uh, instead. Yeah, that's what, but how to do that? And secondly, if an AC2 machine got a public IP, then okay even if our ec2 machine is private we still have a public ip but that public ip won't be useful because it doesn't have any internet connection so it will not be useful so how to access this data our first problem was to create a public instance and private instance we have created a public instance and private instance our second challenge was though our ec2 machine is in private mode we cannot able to download the data we cannot even download the Apache server. We cannot download any data. But now we have solved that problem via NAT gateway. So we can now download the packages. We can upload the packages, whatever the, uh, things that we want to do. We can do this. But the problem is now we do not have any public IP. So what is the use of again having the public is a private EC2 machine having a NAT gateway? And everything. Can we use application gateway? Application gateway, what exactly it is? There's no application gateway. <laughs> This is now private, right? So it cannot be accessed in the cloud. To access in the cloud, you have to assign associate with the public IP. Sorry, sorry, once again. Only then it will get. Uh, we need to uh, provide uh, the. Uh, We need to associate this with the public IP. We need to associate the public IP. How to do that? The last thing we did it in this security group, right? Yeah, I have opened the security group. Okay. Now the security, security group is open. Security group is open. It can have any communication which is coming from port 80. It can receive. But to receive the connection, it must have a public IP or public DNS. Yes. You have to add this in that public instance. Sorry, one second. Uh, Water routing. Uh, the elastic IP. Yeah, last thing they added associated with the public IP. Then the traffic went outside. The public. The TNTL. Attending the security group from here. There is caching. You have to allow internet. No, no, no. If you don't have any public IP, 
outside means that the IT port will not be accessible. So you Correct. have to allow it to get it. But if you get a public IP, uh, public IP is only accessible if you are in situ instance is a public subnet. Yes. So what is the use of having a private subnet and private EC2 machine? Sir, in NAT, NAT gateway, any, uh... hello? NAT gateway will only serve the data to your private EC2 machine. Whatever the request is coming, whatever the request okay. that private EC2 machine is doing, that will be go to the internet and data will be come back. But internet okay. user cannot initiate a request to the private machine. Private machine can have an internet communication. But internet cannot initiate a request to your private machine. So in that case, what will what is the use of having such kind of infrastructure? All right. See, uh, Dalit, in general terms, no. Hello. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In general, traditional firewall or anything, uh, we associate. Uh, what we try to do is uh, we try to uh, you know uh, create an object where uh, the public IP will be uh, matted with a private IP. Yeah, that's what we have here on our Bash uh -huh. server. There is a private IP on which this public IP is mapped. Yes. So when you call this public IP from the internet, this will be accessible. Correct. But to have but accessibility, we must think... require an internet connection. Just, just wait a second. So now let's say I want to connect to your computer. For my computer, I want to connect to your computer via RDP. All right. So you have given me your public IP so from my public IP. I will connect to your public IP and then I can just log into your system and I can connect to your system via RDP connection. Correct. Yes, that's possible. Correct. Correct. But what if your computer do not have internet connection? Oh. Will you have the public IP now? No. Exactly. That's what our problem is. I want to connect to your computer, but your computer is not connected to the internet. So you do not have any public IP. Now what you have is your own private connection in your system that just uh, through which only you can download the data. You can do whatever the surfing you want to do from your system, but you are not allowing me to connect to you. Correct. So how I can connect to you now? What 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 do we need to do this? Hey, out, outbound traffic or anything actually, you know? Yeah, even outbound traffic is open. All ports are open to the world. We have private subnet also. All outbound traffics are open. What is load balancer? Okay. Yes, load balancer will have a public IP and uh, okay. okay. Load balancer will have a public IP. Our bastion is also having a public IP. What next? Yes. So you have to uh, associate uh, this. Uh, this uh, DC2 machine with the load balancer on a public IP. Okay, so you mean to say uh, there will be a load balancer through which the request will be sent, and this load balancer will send the request to the EC2 machine. Mm -hmm. So we also have a bastion server that also. 
but load balancer will uh, have a single uh, uh, IP, but uh, load balancer will also have a DNS, right? Yeah, it's okay. So, Our Papa should just have a public IP or public DNS. So, you can access a private EC2 machine. And where will you create a load balancer? Where you will create a load balancer? When you have more traffic. Okay. My question is, we have two subnets. In which subnet will you create load balancer? Public or not? Public, of course. All right. Yeah. So let's just have a look on this picture. This is a real-time architecture. Just try to understand. These are the millions of users who is, uh, is requesting to your data. Correct? When they are when they are uh, sending the request to your domain, this is your domain route 53. The request comes to your route 53. Now, once this route 53 understand this uh, request is coming to your AWS cloud, this enters to your AWS cloud infrastructure here. On this route 53, you configure where the request is coming from, where the request is coming, and where it should be forwarded. So here you have configured your application load balancer. All right. Yeah. So you have an ability zone one A and one B. Basically, our two subnets, submit one A and submit one B, through which we are achieving high ability. True. So request will come to the application load balancer. Now, application load balancer, what it will do is, which is created in public subnet, it will then send the traffic to both the EC2 machine in our private subnet. Because the connection between application load balancer and the EC2 machine are happening on instance private IP, correct? Yes. So, yeah. So, the communication between application load balancer and or any kind of load balancer and the EC2 machine is working on the instance private IP. So, we do not worry about public IPs. Okay. So, the request will come to, uh, to one of the EC2 machine one by one to each of the machine and the request will be then forwarded to the user. So in that case, we need to make sure that our all the EC2 machines are in private mode and our load balancer is in public mode. This is only for HTTP or HTTPS requests because application load balancer supports only two kinds of ports, 443 and 80, right? For rest of the job, we have here management subnet that is passion. That is, we have created one passion subnet in one of the subnet through which we will do SSH to both the private machines to configuration. If you want to download the Apache server, if you want to configure anything, if you want to install anything, whatever things that you want to do, via this passion server, you will connect to all the EC2 machine running inside it. And for Request sending whenever user is coming uh, request users request is coming it will come via this application load balance. Okay. All right. Now you got it. This is the yes, one yes. of the most secure infrastructure and this is the same thing that you need to follow in all the architectures you will design. Now this is one of the security group on the security what we have there is a load balancer and there is one auto scaling like auto scaling if you want to do between you know the two subnets then you can do so with this infrastructure you have fault tolerance capacity you have high availability you have a secure infrastructure so all the three four pillars that we are talking about about the aws well architecture framework this architecture has everything So can you anyone tell me to design such infrastructure? What are the steps that we need to take? Starting from the basics from even creation of the VPCs and everything. What are the things that we need to do to set up the entire infrastructure except the route to
Yes, anyone? The first, uh, how many AC machines? How many AC machines you want? Uh, as of now, let's say one, but that will be in auto scaling mode, so it doesn't matter. Okay. So, so first of all, we need to create a VPC. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Second step: How many subnets do we require? Two subnets. Two, three. Two private and one public. Uh, okay, one public for what? Load balancer. What about one the basher? Basher. Uh, basher. Two, two public and one private. Load balancer any will come in public also. Now what is the uh, what is the conditions and limitations of application load balancer, network load balancer? I think when we are configuring application load balancer, the condition is application load balancer must require two subnets in two different ability zone. And network load balancer requires only one subnet in one ability zone. This is the condition, I guess. Okay. Is that true? Network. Network requires only one average zone in one of the subnet. There is no condition, minimum requirement. But for the application road balancer, the minimum requirement is it must have two subnets in two different ability zones. Yeah. yeah, so how yeah. many subnets now? Two subnet, two subnets. Only two, two subnet, two, two for private per application, and one one for public one public sub uh, subnet for bashin. Okay. So from my understanding, now here you need to look into this picture. This is every zone one A, and this is every zone one B. When we have two ability zones, it means we create subnets in two different zones. Correct? Yes. Because one subnet is always equal to one ability zone. And one subnet you cannot enter two ability zones. So when we are creating application load balancer subnet, we need to always have ability zone one A and ability zone one B, two subnets. So for application load balancer, we will require two subnets. Similarly now. For our application, which is residing in our private subnet, if we want to achieve the high availability, then we must always have two ability zone again, which means two subnets. Correct? Yes. So two plus two, four, and then we will require one for the management. That will be fifth. So total five subnets will require. VPC one, subnet five. Next what? What will be the next step? Uh, this is Internet Gateway. So we need to create an Internet Gateway, right? We need to create an internet gateway. We need to attach internet gateway. Then, then we can do two, two machines and we can set up everything. Now, out of this total infrastructure, we have one VPC and two subnets. So, what we will do is we will quickly create three more subnets and then we will configure everything. All right. Did you get this diagram? Yes, sir. Everyone, any doubt? So here you can see we have subnet 192.168.0.0/24, and the another subnet is 0.0/24. So let's create a few more. Now before that, let's just make it subnet one. I would say here one in 
this is for apple uh sorry this is for the passion i guess yeah this is for the passion terms and management this is for alp 1b if this is the average is on 1b so i will name as 1b here i will create one more one a uh would you mind to please mute there are a lot of voice is coming from your side thanks so i will select vpc1 and just now i will select us east 1a and 192 168 2.0 24 is that fine and hit on create so you have one management subnet you have one management subnet in US East 1A on which we have a uh, passion server. Then we have application load balancer A and B. This uh, just a slice. On our ALB, on our this subnet, the one that we have previously created, we have one EC2 machine running. And this is our private subnet, right? So I will just name it as application. 1a and i will also make this one private application 1b and then we will create application load balancer subnet alp 1a so that we don't need to change any diagram here 192 168 3.0 slash 24 And similarly, one more ALB 1B for our VPC 01 in 1B and 192 168 4.0 slash 24. All right, so we got our management server on which our passion server is re residing then we have two private subnets application load application 1a and application 1b on which our ec2 machine will connect and then we have two subnet alp 1a and alp 1b now out of these five subnets this subnet this three subnet we need to make is public and the rest of the two subnets we need to make a private correct So going to the routing section, selecting our public route tables and the subnet association. We'll edit the subnet association and we'll make application load balancer 1 and 1B public. And now to the private route table, we'll make the application subnets 1 and 1B to the private so now we have entire infrastructure in public and private mode which we exactly wanted to have now what will be the next step yes guys from your side so next next up is routing tables uh, yeah, we have just the routing tables we have done this process. Private part, private. Which gateway? NAT gateway is already. NAT gateway is already created. Internet gateway is already created. This is the existing system on which we are working on. Uh, some private private uh, private to different locations. Sorry, pardon? We have to associate the uh, subnets to the EC2 instance. All right. So now we have one passion server and we have one EC2 machine. Let's call it our application is under this server all right 
as of now we have only one server out of this two subnets we have only one ec2 machine and we will configure the auto scaling mode so if one server goes out out of the power it will automatically create the another ec2 machine that's fine next what Yes, guys, the picture is in front of you and everything. Load balancer configured. Application load balancer. Load balancer only submit your return. Yeah, so we need to configure the load balancer. Load balancer. So going to the loop answer section. Application load balancer. Here we say uh, DL anything. I will make it as I will keep at internet facing load balancer. AD port open in our own VPC 01. And then we have the average is one yes is one a and one b now in use is one a which submit do you want to connect that is elb one a and in use is one b we have created elb one b so that particular select here and click on next configure security groups we'll create a new security group and what we'll say elb http port open to the world Next configure routing, create a target group. Everything default. We'll just shorten the threshold. Register targets, the two targets that we are running. Uh, so which target? Both the targets or the application one? Application. Correct. Next review and create. You just copy in the DNS endpoint, go into the browser, and it will take few seconds. Try showing there is no target. So the process is initializing. It says unhealthy. Uh, I'll check. So, unhealthy. We have run the entire thing. But still, it's saying. W HTML. This is our public directory. We are index.html. I'll create just small file. 
Hello. Uh, yes. Now we are getting the data from our DNS endpoint application load balancer. So this becomes our front end to all the requests that are coming. Once the request is coming, it will go to your private machines. It will take the data and then upload back to the application load balancer. Correct. So here on the inbound section, still the AT port is open to the world. Is it required to open this world to the world? Not required. Yes, is it required now to open this port AT port on the application load balancer? Oh, it's required. Load it's balancer required. is required. It's required. Is re required? Yes. But it's not. Uh, but still, uh, like uh, if it is open to the world 0 dot 0 dot 0 dot 0 slash 0, then why we are not able to get the request from the instance private IP? Can we make it more secure? Because now the request is coming from the application security group. So can we do like this? Remove this part and we'll make it application load balances in the group and click on save. So what does this mean? It says if the request is coming 22 port from Bastion server, then you are allowed on port SSH. And if a request is coming on port HTTP on port 80 from the application load balancer, then only it's allowed. Did you get this entire part, entire infrastructure? Any doubt? Uh, Lalit, can you please explain, uh, Submit, repeat that other. step, uh, allowing the port uh, to the private instances? Yeah. So basically, what you need to do is click on this private security group, the whatever the security group that you have, and then click on edit. On the HTTP endpoint, you just need to type S and there will be a list of security group. So this is the security group that we are associated to our application load balancer. The one that we have created to care for the application load balancer will select that security group. So if a request is from the application load balancer, then only we will allow. And then here on port 22, the request is coming from the public security group that is from the Bastion security group, then only do allow for the SSH. No other user should be allowed. So that's what we did. Now our private interest is clearly private. Okay, yeah, thank you. Now I have another question. What if I delete that gateway? Sorry? What if I delete the NAT gateway? The NAT gateway which I have created, what will happen to this NAT gateway if I delete? You cannot, private cannot directly access public. Yeah, the private cannot access internet, internet, not required also. So, but the application will run. Application will right? Yeah, application will still run. Only the thing is the private uh, EC2 machines will not be able to access internet. It's not required Absolutely. now. Absolutely true. So now based on our architecture, the one that we have designed, do we require any internet connection now in our system? Uh, no. no, no, not required. Because we have already downloaded the packages that we want. We have configured everything. Now we do not require any internet connection for anything. And yes. we know that NAT gateway is highly chargeable. So can I just oh. remove this NAT gateway? Yes, yes. Hmm. 
Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, Ralik, yes, yes. uh, how is the NAT get, get the charge based on the uh, downloads what you are doing, usage or what? Yes, based on the number of transmission you are doing plus how it will charge. Because it contains NAT configuration as well as it contains elastic IP. So you will be get highly charged for this using a NAT gateway. Okay. Similarly, NAT instance. So I'm ready this NAT gateway. So you can use only NAT gateway whenever you actually want. Once your purpose is served, your installation, downloading, and everything is done, you can just remove this NAT card. So are we clear as of now, whatever we have seen so far? Any question in doubt? No. Any other alternative way for assigning internet for private? No. Only NAT instance and NAT gateway. In other any way, if you provide internet gateway to your EC2 machine on your private EC2 machine, that will become public. All right then. So we have application load balancer on which our front end is working and uh, without any internet connection is still working. So entire, our entire infrastructure from all the perspective is secure. So with this architecture, we have security, we have fault tolerance capacity, we have auto scaling features, we have then high availability, we have all the things which is required to design an infrastructure on the AWS cloud based on the well architecture framework and the best practices, correct? So next thing what we'll see is now. Now coming to the next point, VPC peering. We have a giant network, more than 65,000 of IP address, or if you want to distribute your IR VPC into multiple groups, into multiple groups, then we have a VPC peering. So VPC peering connection is a networking connection between two VPCs that enables you to create a traffic between them privately. Instances in each of VPC can communicate with each other as if they are within the same network. You can create a VPC peering connection between your own VPC with a VPC in another account or VPC in different AWS region. So whatever it is your combination, you can design your infrastructure. Now, as you can see here, there is a VPC 100016 and there is a VPC 200016. If you have a VPC peering connection between to this two VPC, any instances can connect to another instances just like they are within the same network. We have created one public EC2 machine and then we have created a private EC2 machine into different subnets and then we have connected from public to private. Now the same you can do from one VPC to another VPC. The condition is uh, okay, there is one more scenario. 
let's say there is a VPC A 10 10 0 0 slash 16. There is another VPC B 20 20 0 0 16. And it will, in between these two VPCs, there is a VPC PRE. Then we have VPC C that is 30 30 0 0 16. And in between B and C, there is a VPC peering connection. So between A and B, there is a VPC peering and there is a VPC peering connection between B and C. So if you are sending or connecting any EC2 instance in this VPC to directly to C, this kind of communication is not possible. Sending a data connecting to a machine from VPC A to VPC C via VPC B is not possible. You need to have a dedicated link between VPC A and VPC C. Then only you will be able to communicate between A and C. That is, it supports only transitive peering. And the last thing is, two VPCs cannot be connected together if they both have same CID range. 10 10 0 0 slash 16. All right. So we have one VPC 192.168.0.0 slash 16. Let's create one more VPC. Uh, VPC 02 and 192.169. Zero dot zero class sixteen. Let's say and on this VPC two, we will just create one subnet. Subnet VPC two. One ninety two one sixty nine. 1.0 slash 24. All right, so we have, let's say, you have one management submit and you have a submit in another VPC that is in submit 1A, uh, in submit VPC 1A and 1B. This is your VPC 01 and this is your VPC 02. So any EC2 instance in this management submit, if you want to have communication on this EC2 instance in another VPC, we'll see how to do that. So to do that, uh, let me just quickly create one more EC2 machine. This time VPC2, there is only one submit. And as we do not have any internet connection, so there is no purpose of assigning public IP or not. Add storage, add tax, let's say private VPC hyphen zero two. Review, launch, launch. All right, so now going back to the VPC part, from the left hand side, there is a VPC peering connection subdriver. What you need to do is create a VPC peering connection and here you can give a tag. Let's say VPC peer. Now, which VPC is your requester and which VPC is your acceptor? That you need to define. So definitely requester will be one of your VPC so let's say my requester is VPC01. It doesn't matter. And now, who is going to be your acceptor? That is another VPC. Whether it is in my account or whether it is in another account. Whether it is in same AWS region that is North Virginia or whether it is present in another region. So one of you have asked this question like if this belongs to another region, then how we can connect? So from this, you can select another region and select the region where the another VPC is residing and select that region. Now, as of now, we both are in the same region. So we'll select this same region. If it is an, another account, you can give the 12-digit account ID and that person will get the 
request so in my aws account in this region which is the acceptor let's say vpc2 is my acceptor so the requester is 192.168 and the acceptor is 192.169 create a peering connection so now it says a vpc peering connection has been successfully requested which means this is under still pending until the acceptor accept the condition the request will not be fulfilled as a vpc requester and acceptor both are in the same thing in the same region what we need to do is click on action and click on accept request yes accept now here you can see the connection is active but it doesn't mean that your ec2 machine can talk to another ec2 machine directly now what we need to do is we need to change the routing part so going to the route table section in your default one we'll just do the routing section that is at routes and here we need to define the opposite ip range here it has 192 168 so this time we'll define 192 169.0.0 slash 16 target will be our vpc peering connection the one that we have just created i click on save now the same thing that we need to do on our vpc2 route table this is a vpc2 default route table on this also we need to do the same edit routes and here it says 192 116 so we need to do opposite 192 168 0 0 slash 16 and from here we'll select again peering connection and vpc peer and click on save routes now your ec2 machine that is passion server can connect to your another private machine in another vpc let's just have a look let's just try then ssh hyphen i same key and this time i will connect to ec2 hyphen user to another ec2 machine in another vpc that is private vpc in my vpc 02 via instance private ip yes connect and you are successfully connected just like your home All right, any question, any doubt in this part? This is Lalit, the one question. Yes. Yes, yes, please. Can you create VPC peer in two different locations? So two you different said, locations. Sure. Two different regions. Two different regions, yes. But of course, in the VPC peering connection, create a peering connection, and here you can select another region. Let's say currently I am in North Virginia, all right. Let's say my another VPC in Mumbai. So I just need to select this Mumbai. And here I need to pass the VPC ID. So wherever the VPC uh, accept it, I need to copy the VPC ID and yes. Yeah, Lalit, uh, one quick question. Uh, the, uh, is 
there any uh, too much of latency uh, sub, say suppose uh, me connecting to uh, mumbai vtc uh, or uh, me connecting to say from uh, india i connect to, to any other uh, region will there be latency uh, based on the distance no 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 this is amazon private link so there will be no latency as such okay Lalit, if we want to practice, we need to create a VPC, no? A VPC gateway also, no? No, no, so not, VPC, not VPC gateway, just a VPC peering connection. No, no. Like, if you want to practice this one, lab practice in home, yes. so we have to create a gateway, no? VPC gateway, so it will be charged, no? Uh, why you need to do that? VPC gateway. You want you're talking about NAT gateway? Yeah, NAT gateway. Sorry. NAT gateway is when you want internet. Okay. If you want to download on a private uh, oh, machine, is, if you want to download or anything, that time if you no know download or anything is required. Oh, okay. So as so one thing now, can we design in such a way that one VPC is for only management? Other is for the production, so that the management VPC will have an internet connection, and the production infrastructure will not have any internet connection. I think it is possible. Is it possible? It should be. Yeah, just. This can easily talk to another subject without having internet connection. You can see here internet gateway. There is only two internet gate. One for the default VPC and one for the VPC zero one. We haven't uh, attached any VPC, any internet gateway to VPC2. No, no, no. Neither the NAT gateway. No, no, no. Lalit, but, uh, yeah. yeah, continue. Yeah, I was saying, though we are saying that another VPC will not require any internet connection, but still you need to create an internet gateway. For then, first of all, if you are having a public subnet for your application load balancer, then it will require an internet gateway. Correct? If you are having a NAT gateway, if you want a NAT gateway, then you will require a public subnet, which means again you will require an internet connection. So though we are having a two separate VPC, one for the management and second for the production. Still, we will have an internet connection. Do you guys want to try this? Because this is not easy as it seems. Lalit, uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, creating a Pairing connection to VPC in a different region is it possible? Pairing Pardon? connection. Pardon? One second. No. Create a pairing connection, not VPC connection. He showed me that it's VPC. Pairing, VPC, pairing, yes. That is what he showed me. No, this is pairing connection. connection. It's different. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. No, if uh, we have two pairing connection, you have two pairing connection to the same VPC. Yeah, is it possible to create in the same region, a different region? Yeah, yeah, of course. You can have fifty different kinds of VPC pairing connections. Okay. If you guys want some time to try this, you can try it now.
because this is uh, seems not very easy vpc part you need to go through a lot of things to troubleshoot all this networking part so if you want to try it, I have one more question. Yes. But peering connections are only available in VPC in the same region, right? No, man. It is available there in all the regions. He showed no practically the Laotian is also a different region. See here. He when you click on create, see look 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 into the screen. When you click on create peering connection, here it says, Do you want to connect to this region or to another region? So from another region, you can select one of the region. In which you want to have communication. It's Let's say it's in way. North Virginia, and now I want to connect from Mumbai. So, whatever the VPC, I need to provide the VPC ID here, and I can click on create VPC peering connection. That's all. Right. Now in now in Mumbai, I can have 10, 20 different types of number of VPCs. I just need to pull the exact vpc on which i want to have peering connection copy the vpc id and paste it here that's all just let me show you i'll show you so this is uh, i am connecting now to the mumbai All right, in Mumbai, just have a look on Mumbai. I have one default VPC. I'll just copy the VPC ID where it is here. All right, now in North Virginia region, I'm creating another VPC peering connection. The requester will be this default in North Virginia. Oh, sorry, this won't be possible. VPC one to another region. Let's say in Mumbai, and this will be my acceptor. All right, name the connection peer two. Then, so this is between this have a look. This is between North Virginia to Mumbai. <laughs> In two different regions. Now, what you need to do is you need to go to the Mumbai region, go to the peering connection, and here you'll find one request. You need to just click on accept request from US East 1A to AP South 1A. And your connection has been successfully established. All right. From US to Mumbai. Do you have any doubts? Let me know. Uh, no, really. Uh, I insist you if you have any questions or if you want to try, you can try it now. Uh, I can give you 30 minutes, you can try because it seems very easy, but it's not that easy. The all the PC part. So if you want to try, you can just share your screen and try. So are you trying or shall we just move what will no no i think i will try it later rather i think it requires uh, a lot of time and also you know follow the lot of procedure all right we'll do it, we'll do it later Meanwhile, can, can you give me some examples or uh, real time asking us so where uh, this load balancing and uh, uh, the different communication between the different EC2 instances? And do you have any uh, use cases, real time use cases where how 
the connectivity so the and diagram, the connectivity. yes the diagram that i have showed you is a common architecture like to always whenever you, this is a very small thing so whenever you are having communication uh, from your public to private you need to follow the same thing i'll just show you Uh, let's just assume this is your VPC. Uh, Alright, let's assume this is your VPC. And inside this VPC, there are two boundary zones. So let's say there are two every zone, one A and one B, and then we have few EC2 machines and few subnets. So let's say this is your front end, this is your back end services, and this is your database. Alright. So whenever your user are hitting to your side. They will come to your front end. From front end, it will go to the back end, and from back end, they will go to the database. Now, these are the subnets in each of this every zone. There are two subnets for the front end. There are two subnets for the back end. There are two subnets for the database. Correct. Now, yes. There are multiple EC2 instances running, and they are on the auto scaling and ELP everything. So now, how you are going to configure the entire infrastructure? What are the things that you will require? Let's say this is a theta architecture now. To understand, to execute this theta architecture, what are the resources you will create? What are the AWS services? You will require to design this data architecture. You have one VPC, you need to design it to a different energy source. Now, what next? Guys, what next? This is your front end, this is your back end, and this is your database. So, how you are going to configure in real time? Uh, the front end will be in public. Hello? Why we require a public to, to access the uh, internet? I have to download the required outside load balancer when load, load balancer is there, it is not required. Now, private. Hello? Hello? Sorry, Malik, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, firstly, I yeah. know the most uh, question was very simple. What are the resources that you want to design? What are the resources you will require? One system in public and two system to one private. Two, Two are in private. Two are in private. Huh? Which two are public and which two are private? DB in private, database should be in private. Yeah, the same thing with DB and database. Okay, the database part will be in the private, and the yeah. icon of front end will be in the private. Sorry. The database will be in the private, and yeah. the Back end or front end will be in the private? The back end. Back end, back end, back end Okay. So you, here you have two subnets and here you have two subnets. Total four subnets will be in the private. Okay, what next? I think now uh, public also can we can uh, kept on uh, another uh, private subnet. 
Okay, the front end can be also in the private. Yes, if you are using application load balancer. Okay, the six subnets we will require, which is in a private mode. Okay, next. Yes. And we need to create uh, two easy to instance. Okay. One for the front end, one for the back end, correct? Yes, yeah. All right. And we need to And we need to configure the load balancer. We need a load balancer. Okay. How many load balancer you will require? Or two way. Two way. One for the uh, network and one for the application, the back end. Okay, one for the front end and one for the back end. Uh, which load balancer will you use? Application load balancer. Uh, why application? Why network? Why not network? The front end only the front end will be connected. Uh, the end user will be talking only to the front end. That also you can do with the network load balancer. Network load balancer also support 80 port, 8443 port. Yes, yes. Network load balancer also can be used, uh, but here it is, uh, you are having uh, one, uh, their uh, limitation is one subnet, right? No, no, no. We have six subnets, right? Two here, two here, and two here. We have six subnets. So I think application network both can achieve this part but you said uh, it should be on uh, two regions right uh, application load balancer supports for uh, subnets on two regions right correct but so my load balancer has to be on the single region or something correct at least one single average zone you can yeah, have yeah. multiple zone, at least one. Yeah. We can we can have two uh, application load balancer. You can have two application load balancer. So, uh, one two application instances one network balancer. Oops. One two subnets and Six subnets over no six subnets here only. Subnet here only that you have taken six subnets. So for one instance, two subnets and here two subnets, six subnets you have taken totally. Now here separated see for you can see. So six subnets. Why two only? Yeah. Only two regions, right? And then one now you have six submit all right yeah So application on network. Two more uh, two load balancers is more than enough. Now one is front end and another one can use for back end. Now. Correct. Two, we require two load balancer. Now which load yeah. balancer? Application load balancer or network load balancer? Uh, front end will use application because the application is accessing from front end only. Now we have to use uh, application will be in front end only. Uh, why not network? I think from network also we can also connect from the internet. Network, uh, network will be in public. No? Load no, balancer network. Uh, load. Is like, all load so balancer will be on public only. All load balancer will be on public only. That is front facing, right? Uh, 
So if uh, the application load balancer supports, uh, if it is only HTTP uh, and HTTPS, we can use uh, application load balancer. PC payments. AT and 443 that is HTTP and HTTPS are also TCP. So both any uh, I think uh, either low, network load balancer or application load balancer can be used. <laughs> I need one. <laughs> I know I both can, I'm asking you which one will you go? And why? I think application load balancer holds good. But why? Reason? Uh, because front end only the application front end will be connected to public. Uh, we we will be given to users and users. It's okay for the back end also. You can again use. You can create two subnets which is in private mode and create a application load balancer. For example, what you are saying is, uh, let me just, what you are saying is here you have two subnets again on the public side, right? And on these two public subnets, you will create an application load balancer which will load the balance between two private EC2 machine on the front end, correct? The same you can do. For the private also, you can create a private EC2 machine and create an application load balancer. Load balancer is not restricted to public subnet or private subnet. This is your condition. If you want to have access on the internet, you will require a public subnet. If you do not want to have access on the internet, you can remove the private public part. So why application? Why not network? Network also support HTTP and HTTPS. It's a TCP. So I can yeah. use it for the front end also, for the back end also. Then why we are not using the network load balancer and why we are using application load balancer? Because uh, it, uh, only network load balancer supports two subnet in two different zones. Uh, see. The minimum condition of application load balancer is it requires to create uh, the minimum uh, condition of an application load balancer is to create an application load balancer. You must have two subnets in two different availability zone. And when okay. you are create a network load balancer, the minimum condition is you must that require a single, zone, a single subnet. Okay. So I don't think it's a major issue. Even for the front end also, we can create a one single subnet and we can create a network load balancer. Yes, anyone? Why application? Why not network?
Hello, are you guys trying and are you actually doing the lab section or what? <laughs> Discussing it, the, that's it. Uh, okay, all right, fine. Why application load balancer, not a link load balancer, network load balancer? Uh, network load, application load balancer. Huh? So web, ser web server will uh, distribute the load in the application load balancer, I think. Same problem. Hmm. Link, link is only network, uh, but the application means web server load, uh, it will uh, distribute the load. Web servers will be there. Hello? Hello, yes. Uh, uh, Lalit, in uh, web server load balancer, so load will distribute among the web server. You mean to say front end? Huh? What? Front end or back end? You are talking about the uh, first year or second year? Front end. Front end. Front end. Web servers. Okay. The front end web servers. All right. So that load will be uh, distributed among the uh, web servers when application load balancer. Correct. I think that is the job of a load balancer, not the application or the network. Even okay, if you use a class, classic load balancer, then also it will distribute the load between all the web servers. Okay. Actually, what is the question? So here, he has given a scenario. Okay. Okay. Where two different subnets and two other zones are there. Okay. Here we will be having two servers. One backend server, one database server, one backend server, and frontend server. Okay. Okay. So here he said which load balancer has to be used. He said it has to be application load balancer. Mm -hmm. Why application, not network load balancer? Okay. 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 That's correct. See, I think we have to use a network load balancer. For uh, uh, auto scaling. Application load balancer we have to use for auto scaling. Auto scaling. Yeah. In network load balancer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Reverse. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, tell I me. Think, uh, for auto scaling, we have to use the application load balancer. Uh, auto scaling doesn't support network load balancer. Sir, uh, here uh, maybe uh, we don't require any static IP or something. Uh, elastic, elastic IP, IP. Uh, load balancer doesn't give you any static IP. <laughs> Load you load load you need load to load have load an elastic IP, right? Sorry, pardon? Pardon, please? Uh, uh, network load balancer, you need to have an uh, el uh, elastic IP. No, that's, uh, that, that's not actually required. If you want that, you can configure uh, elastic IP to the network load balancer. If not, then it's fine. Routing anything? Sorry? Server, uh, server authentication. Uh, no, no, no. Not, not for that purpose. Why here uh, application load balancer both the side and not the network load balancer? Load, uh, load balancer, load balancer, load balancer, balancer. 
deletion won't happen because, in network because from my perspective application load balancer will only support 80 and 443 http and https but network yes. load balancer will give you all the tcp yes. so why you are application load balancer not the network load balancer no, uh, in network the load balancer cannot be deleted. Once if if we attach load balancer, we cannot delete in network. It can be deleted in application. Uh, you mean to say if you have created a network load balancer, then you cannot delete? Yes. No, you can delete a network load balancer whenever you want. In network, we cannot. Uh, no, no. Whatever you want, you can. It goes on AWS. Okay. So let's just sort it out uh, little by little. What are the features of application load balancer? So application uh, request on HTTP and HTTPS will be uh, uh, shared to shared equally on the printed machine. Uh, okay. And what are the features of network load balancer? Network load balancer uh, can uh, uh, share the request of any TCP request. Correct. Application will only give HTTP and HTTP request. It will only accept HTTP and HTTP accept. But whereas yes. the network load balancer will accept all the TCP requests, uh, whichever you want to enable. That's true. Anything else different? Any other differences? In application de uh, data will pass uh, in encrypted mode. In network it won't pass. No? If you are able, if you are able additional certification, then it will not require. It will be secured one. If you open SSL certificate, if you are uh, attach an SSL certificate, then the entire communication will be secured. <laughs> So in application gateway, it will handle both request and response also. Uh, so network doesn't support that. Okay. To so understand this, how this network will have incoming and outgoing connection. Any load balancer, how it will have incoming and outgoing outgoing connection. Any load balancer will have uh, how any load balancer will have incoming and outgoing requests. So yeah, how, how is going to maintain all these connections? Round robin. No, no. Via no, security right. group, if you enable allow that port, it will accept the connection. Similarly, whatever the ports that you will describe the incoming part and the outgoing part, it will work for that. Correct. Correct. So it doesn't matter whether it's the application load balancer or network load balancer. In both the security groups, you can open the incoming port and outgoing port, whatever you want. 80, 443, 72, 94, etc. Whatever you want. So why application and not the network? Let's do one thing. Let's take a 15 minutes break. 
and in this 15 minutes break you can have a tea and think of this uh, problem why application and why not the network and then after 15 minutes we'll see the solution all right no elastic if you don't want it here also you can okay all right
Hello. Yes, Lali. Okay, let me call you one second. Okay, first thing you do, you have a colleague of Scotty. Hello. Because there are three requests that are coming from the discussion. So, did you come to the answer? Solution? We could find the, we could not find anything. But one thing we checked, maybe network load balancer can't find whether the application is available or not. Okay, that's absolutely good. Correct, this is the reason why we are having the application load balancer and not the network load balancer. Okay, okay. So, when a user is heading to your web servers, at the time, you must require... Sir, you can refer to probably our own. So when there are millions of users who are requesting to your application, so whenever they head to your domain, it is must required that your application is working or not. So, so at the front end, you can have application load balancer that will check whether the application is residing in your web server is running perfectly or not. If it is running perfectly, then only it will send the request to the end user. When the user uh, sends the request, when the request comes to your web server, now comes the second part of your backend server or the application server. So from web server to application servers, you can either have a application load balancer or you can go with a network load balancer. It's up to you. Now when to go for application and when to go for network between web servers and application server. In between application servers and uh, uh, web servers, if these two communication between these two application is happening on a certain port rather than 80 or 443, then you should go for a network based load balancer. If the application load balancer is again responding at port 80 or 443, you can go with the application load balancer that will again check whether the application is running or not. If it is not running at it port 80 or 43, if it is running on another certain port between web servers and application server, then there is no other option than going for a network based load balancer. All right. Okay. Now, let's say we have a gaming website. All right. For a gaming website, a user can play from a mobile phone or a user can play from a uh, game or any HTTP or HTTPS endpoint from a browser. So when it comes to that point, you have a front end, you have a back end, and then you have a database again. On a front end, a user must be logged in, a user identity will be logged in, and then he will be entered to the application load, application side, whether he will actually play the game. And whatever the game score and whatever the actions will be done, that will be returned into the database, correct? So when a user is playing from the website or from a web browser, the user will head to the application load balancer, which will see the front end, which will see the web server where he can log in or he can sign up, whatever the actions he want to take. And then he can actually play the games on the application server side. If a user does not have, if the user is not playing from the browser, if he's playing from, let's say from a mobile application, Let's say the user is playing from the mobile application. So once this user is logged in via this mobile application, he will not require to again travel from the front end and go to the back end and then to the database and whatever the thing. Whenever a uh, application will be opened at that time, first time it will be asked for the login password, which will be directly communicated directly to the database for the sharing the login credential for logging purposes and for signing up the thing. So this application will directly communicate to the database. Secondly, when once this person, once this user is successfully logged in, the next time he don't need to again log in every single time. At that time, what he will do, he will just go to the application site and then he will able to play the site. 
now definitely when we are talking about the gaming application the gaming application will not be supported on port 80 or 443 at that time if it is from the mobile application then uh, most of these people most of this gaming side do not prefer 80 or 443 they are having a communication between two applications running in on a specific port let's say the port will be 789 so this mobile user will create a communication from 789 port on this directly application load balancer which is residing here or the network load balancer technically so this will request to the network load balancer this network load balancer will hit the request to both the servers and then the person can play the games so there are different scenarios in all the different scenario based on the scenario based on the resource uh, questions based on the resource properties you need to identify which resource will suit you best now we have only seen the networking part and the compute part but when it comes to the storage part there are a lot of storage options available ebs efs s3 glacier a lot of options are available so at the time you need to uniquely identify for the user's requirement which requirement suits the best for the their use case all right any other questions doubts uh, no really. all right so just a very small part left uh, in our vpc that is vpc flow log a vpc flow log is a feature that will log all the futures whatever the in the network transaction is happening between all the servers in your vpc all the incoming requests are coming all the outgoing requests which you are making it will list all the things in this vpc flow log and having a vpc flow log is one of the again aws best practices and well architecture framework through this vpc flow log you can not only identify who is accessing your data and who is not accessing your data from where the requests are coming and from where the request is not coming but you can actually also use or troubleshooting your own infrastructure maybe sometimes we are trying to hit from the port 80 440 and we are not using our data because maybe some due to some reasons of the NACL rule or the security group we haven't enabled that future so in that case to identify the solution we can use this flow log again to identify what exactly the thing that denies the service so here you can see some use cases to troubleshoot why specific target is not reachable diagnose our restrictive security group rules if the security group is very restricted uh, which is not allowing the, any port to have a communication you can diagnose that part and as a security group to monitor monitor your traffic reaching your instances so what kind of requests mm -hmm. what kind of requests are coming to your ec2 machine you can have a log of all the records so for all the purposes a uh, VPC flow log is very important. So to create a VPC flow log, uh, we just need to go to the VPC. Select one of the VPC, the one that you want. Click on action and click on create flow log. Right, filter, accept, rejected, or all like you want to have all the accepted kind of requests to be accepted or the rejected one or the all. best practice you should go with all so that you can identify what are the requests all are coming and going now where you want to dump all this data you want to directly search into the cloud one services where you can all monitor all the services which is incoming and outgoing transition is happening or do you want to collect everything on your st bucket if you want to, to, to dump all the data in your S3, you can send it to the S3 destination or you can send it to the CloudWatch. Now, for this, you need to create a log group. What we'll do is we'll go to the CloudWatch service. And if you click on the log section of this CloudWatch service, uh, this is the old data. What you can do is just click on action 
and create a new flow log. Just name it logs. So you can just create a flow log, new flow logs, and going back to here, you can just click on refresh and then search for the new flow logs, the one that you have just created. Then it will ask for the IM role. Now basically VPC is going to share some data to the CloudWatch. So you need to set up a permission that CloudWatch can have access to the logs of the VPC. So there will be a log, there will be a role between two AWS services. So if you don't know what are the all the services you need to make sure, no need to worry, you can just click on set up permission. And everything which is already created, that is log of create log group string, describe log group log stream, and put log event. These are all the permissions that you will require. You don't need to create anything, just give a name. And click on allow. So once it is created, now you can go back to the Flow log, click on refresh again and select the one that you have just created and click on create. So once you do this VPC flow log, the flow log will be created and the destination folder will be done. That is in our new flow log, the, all the streaming will be created. Now this will take 10 to 15 minutes to see all the logs what are happening in your VPC section as of now we do are not interacting anything. We do not have any EC2 machine. We are not doing anything So there, there will be no logs, but if you have any EC2 instance, you can try that you will find some logs This is my previous VPC flow log. Let's see if it has any log So here you can see there are certain logs available And this is you can see reject accept all different kinds of logs available. If you click on this, you'll find this is the IP from which the request is coming. That is the source IP. This is the destination IP to which EC2 machine the request was sending on port to port didn't mention here. And uh, this is all other different time to leave and what are the other factors. It, everything is here. This request was rejected and it is marked as rejected. Another one here is accepted from this port to this IP address. The request was came. And these are all the requests here you can see. Now on this log group, what you can do is you can create a metric. That is, if any kind of rejection happens, let's say I will go reject and click on test button so here you can see there are different 18 matches found so to on this 18 different matches you can create an alarm so next time whenever any kind of rejection happens you will get a notified email notification you can click on assign metric and give all the things we will see in the cloud watch again where you can give a name and then you can click on alarm and which will create an alarm for you so any time if any rejection happen, then you will get email notification for that. All right. Any other doubt? Any questions in our VPC? Uh, this is yeah. No, no. All right. Let me just delete this. Uh, All right. So moving ahead to our next topic. We'll see the storage part.
that is Amazon S3. All right. So we have S3 that is a object based storage system. Now we have seen the EFS and EPS. EBS can be used for booting up your EC2 machine and EFS can be also used for just storing your data which can be accessible to various uh, different kinds of EC2 machine across your different ability zone. EBS volume at the same time can be used for booting up your EC2 machine. Also, it can be used for storing of your data. Similarly, we have Amazon S3 which is a cloud based storage system but this kind of storage system can be used to all the different kinds of EC2 instance within a VPC, across the VPC, in wherever you want, but you cannot use this volume, you cannot use this S3 storage to boot your EC2 machine. This is again object based storage system. You can upload any kind of file you want, JPG, PNG, temporary file, log file, whatever the data you want to upload, you can upload it but you cannot mount this to the EC2 machine to boot your EC2 volume. Then we have Glacier. A Glacier is only used, uh, the Glacier is similar to S3, but Glacier is only used for infrequently accessed data. S3 can be used for frequently accessed data when you are having import export communication from EC2 machine to the storage, you can go with S3. But if you are having completely infrequently access data, like once in a, you know, four months, six months, a year, at that time you can go for a glacier. Glacier is considered as the archival storage system. Your data will be archived into the Amazon Glacier. The benefit you get here is the data will not be accessible directly whenever you require. You need to request to the AWS and AWS will take three to four hours to process that request and to give you to your data because your data is archived. So Amazon will take that much hours of time. But at the same time, the benefit you get here is it costs only $0.04 per GB per month. Just $0.04. So it's one of the most cheapest options available to store your data which is infrequently accessed, like backup data, etc. Then we have seen EFS file system, which can be mounted to various EC2 machine. Then we have Snowball. A Snowball is a very good service for import export or for migrating of your database from an on-premise to the cloud. Let's say there is a company who is wanted to migrate their, their infrastructure from the cloud to the AWS and they have huge data. The data size is in terabytes or petabytes of data. So at that time when we are talking about terabytes or petabytes of data, it becomes very difficult to upload that data via an internet connection. Because it will cost you hundreds of dollars to upload the data for the internet connection you need to pay. At the same time, if an internet bandwidth goes down, then there will be disruption, inter inter interruption in the uploading of your data. So there are a lot of things when you are trying to upload the data via your internet, there becomes very fuzzy. So AWS Snowball is a service that will easily upload your data to the Amazon S3 taking from your on-premise infrastructure. How it will do? You need to create a snowball service and then Amazon will deliver a briefcase on your home or your office location, whatever the location you will provide. A device will be stored, a device will be delivered to your location. This device will be automatically encrypted from Amazon side. So what you need to do? You need to connect this briefcase to your uh, laptop to your computer and then you need to encrypt it once again. Once you do this encryption, then you can move your entire terabytes or petabytes of data to this device, to this briefcase and then you can again request for a pickup delivery. So Amazon people will come and pick up your device and then they will go to the AWS data center 
and then they will upload all your database to the desired S3 bucket. That is lifting and shifting of your data physically to the AWS cloud. Lalit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, is there any uh, something like auto sync is available from the S3 bucket to the uh, sorry uh, local on-premises device to the S3 bucket? For example, in a real-time basis, I'm keep on storing some data in some folder where uh, you can just uh, pick up the data and push it to the uh, S3 bucket whenever the uh, network is available. Uh, basically, this kind of feature is by default available on S3. It's called multi-part upload. So if you, if uh, S3 if you are trying to upload some data on S3 and in the middle of the connection, if something is lost, your network connection is lost, then once the network is again gained, then it will upload the rest of the part to the S3. So it supports multi-part upload, automatic synchronization. Yeah, what I meant to say is in the, in the folder, uh, is, is it happening in a real time basis? For example, in a real time, I'm keep on storing some uh, data. For example, if you take videos. Suppose multi part upload. So if you use uh, CLI, Amazon CLI to upload your data, then once your connection is restored, it will upload the rest of the data automatically. Is it? Is there any uh, something like uh, to avoid the duplication of uh, uploading the data? All yeah, there are different, different kinds of properties available that you need to figure it out before you upload the data. Uh, Lalit, actually Ravi's question was, you know, is there any you know, option for us to map uh, S3, you know, the bucket, whatever this folder path into linear for local devices, can be anything. Even, uh, yes, yes, we can do. Uh, uh, we are not talking on currently as of now on the SC part we have a lot of things to see on the S3 we are just looking on the snowball okay yeah that, that was his question probably during uh, no, S3 session we can yeah we have all the services we have all the properties that will look into how you can synchronize automatic synchronize your data to the S3 from your local machine <laughs> So this is your snowball device. So when you request a snowball device, this comes to your location and through which you can connect to your computer and then upload your data to this device. And then you can ask for the pickup of your data and that data will be uploaded to that uh, ST bucket, whatever you want. So in this way, you can upload the data, terabytes of petabytes of data without any network connection, network bandwidth outage. Amazon will take care of your entire data and this comes with automatic encryption and you are, you also require to again first uh, encrypt the data before you upload any document any data inside this machine. So this is your snowball. Now there is another service called snow mobile available which is like an entire truck. So if you want to shift or uh, lift and shift the entire AWS uh, on premise architecture like all the web servers storage and everything to the AWS and if you are completely unaware of this to upload the data you can use you can call this AWS truck service AWS mobile which will come to your location and will you know take the entire uh, servers and everything storage part to this truck it comes with complete bodyguarded and everything which will upload your data to the AWS cloud again so this is your snowball snow mobile this is snow mobile and the previous one was the snow ball and then we have already seen the ebs so in this section we'll be more focused on amazon s3 and glacier the rest of the things we have just seen in our existing course so amazon s3 is an object based storage system where you can upload this object any kind of object you want you can upload with S3, you can host website, mobile application, backups and restore, archive your data, enterprise applications you can upload, IoT based devices, IoT based devices continuously upload the mobile applications data or IoT devices data 
like uh, longitude, latitude, and etc. So you can store all this data on S3. And also you can use for the big data analytics. So if you have terabytes or petabytes of data on S3, you can directly connect this data to your analytics application through which you can fire queries on AWS. Amazon S3 is designed for 99.11 nines of durability and availability. So AWS guarantees once your data is uploaded to the AWS, it gives you 99.99% of ability guarantee. The data will never be loose. It replicates your data within the different ability zones and different servers. Certain use cases. You can use Amazon S3 for backup and restore to build uh, for the storing of your backups and archiving your data. You can use S3 to upload your data. Disaster recovery for protecting your critical data applications and IT system running on on premises. You can now store on your uh, on the cloud for archiving your data you can use amazon s3 or if it is completely infrequently accessed data you can either move it to the s3 glacier you can use it for the data lakes and the big data analytics that is if you have a, a huge database storage terabytes of petabytes of data then you can store all the database on the s3 which you can connect directly with the aws services analytical services like uh, quicksight athena glue and the data will be captured from this s3 and the queries will be easily fired there so these are the certain uses for most of the cases that amazon s3 is being used now it depends on from uh, scenario to scenario where you can make a better use of this s3 now s3 is a global service S3 doesn't require any region selection. S3 is a global service. Even if we have created one S3 data, it cannot be created. The same data cannot be created in my AWS account. It's a complete global service. But to upload a data on S3, you will require a S3 bucket. Now, S3 is a global service, but S3 bucket is a region specific. When you create a S3 bucket, you need to select a region. Mumbai, North Virginia, Oregon, whatever it is. At that time, you need to create a bucket. Now, whenever you create a S3 bucket, few things are very important. The name of the S3 bucket should be globally unique. If I have given a name to my S3 bucket ABCD, then you cannot use the same name for your AWS account. This name should be globally unique because S3 is a global service, so the name should be globally unique. S3 bucket is nothing but a container that holds multiple data, just like your folder, a folder that will contain multiple folders, multiple files, just like that. We have a S3 bucket. So a bucket is nothing but a container for objects stored in the Amazon S3. Buckets are region specific, as I told you. Uh, S3 is a global service, but the buckets are region specific. Bucket names must be globally unit. The name should be globally unit, and you cannot use capital letters. It should be in the small letters and the special characters only. The default limit of S3 bucket is 100 buckets per account. In case if you want to increase the size, you can just raise a support ticket. Then AWS S3 offers you unlimited storage. You can upload any uh, an amount of data you want, but a single file size should not exceed more than 5 TB. A file size ranging from 0 KB to 5 TB is allowed, not beyond the 5 TB. You can upload any number of size of data you want on the S3, but a single file size should not exceed more than 5 TB. So I can upload thousands of files with each file uh, size of 5 TB. Do you get, are you getting this guys? A file size should not exceed more than 5 TB. Now comes our data transfer model. How a data is been transferred to the S3. 
So there are two types of consistency model read after write consistency and eventual consistency. Let's to understand this part. Whenever you upload a file on S3, let's say this uh, rectangle is your bucket, and whenever you upload your data on this bucket, this file will be transferred to multiple servers. Whenever you upload a file, the file will be transferred to multiple server, and hence AWS gives you guarantee that the data will be available 99.99%. If a data is lost from one of the copy, the second will always have the data. So whenever you fire a query to search the data, you see the data will be searched from another server. So it always guarantees that the data is always available. So this is the way that AWS write the file in AWS data center. When a file is uploaded, the data, the number of copies will be made of that data. Now, where our consistency models comes into the picture. Let's say I have uploaded a file. The file contains a small description uh, called as name ABC age 40. All right. And I have written this file. So when I write this file, I have made a write one. I have made uh, actions to write or to upload a file on S3. Once I do the upload of this file and then if I am reading this file, I will get the same data because that's what my content of the file. If I uploaded a file with name ABC and age 40 and I uploaded that file on S3 and then I'm trying to read that file, I will get the same content. So this is called read after write consistency. Whatever thing that you have uploaded, if you are reading the same thing, then it's called read after write consistency. Now let's say I have written a file name ABC age 40. All right. This is the file that I have uploaded. After the end of this file, after just few seconds or nanoseconds, another person has written another file. A file called abc.txt. In that file, I have written this con content name ABC age 40. And the, another person also uploaded the same file abc.txt with the configuration details of name ABC H41. It's a little change in the data. So now, after this write one, the write two was made. And then after certain amount of time, the read one was made. Now, once the upload write one file is uploaded to the S3, it will take few seconds to update the same file on the second more servers to update to replicate the data in multiple servers correct so if that data completion if that data you know synchronization between multiple servers is made successful then when you are trying to read the data you will find the same data similarly once this data has been written name abc h40 after this write to has been made name ABC and age 41. If this age 41 has been successfully written and it has been, uh, you know, replicated to all the different servers. And then if you are trying to do the read one, then you will find the data name ABC age 41. And similarly, when you do the read two, again, you will get the data name abc 841 now here if after uploading the right one if the replication takes a time maybe five second ten second depends on the size of the file and then the right two was made which is not yet replicated to all the servers and before it is successfully replicated the read one was taken so before the completion of the exactly the right to of the replication to another servers, the read one was made at that time. The data will here you will get is made by the right one name ABC age 40. But if the right to was successfully replicated at this stage, then the read two will get the data age 41, not age 40. So this is called as eventual consistency. If a data is been read 
after the successful write and it's called read after write consistency if the data is been uh, the previous data if you are getting the previous data then it's called as eventual consistency now this depends from size of the file and the latency as we know if even if you are copying a, uh, a file in our own system like 4 gb or 5 gb of file in our own system it will take few seconds correct it will take few seconds to few minutes depending upon your computing capacity so similarly when you are writing the same file again and again to copy the content from one server to another server at the aws side it will take few seconds so if the second successful uh, if the transaction if the interval is successful before the read has been made then it will be considered as read after write consistency if not then it will be considered as eventual consistency did you get this part any question any doubt in this consistency model and this is confidence just one minute uh, yeah. uh, okay well, how do we continue all right now let's consider third scenario in this third scenario you have written a file write one name abc age 40 and before it is get successfully uploaded or before it uploads completely the write to was made with a different data age 41 let's say now after the route to write to finishes before the write to finishes the read one was made so definitely for the read one you will get read after write consistency that is you will get the data from the right one whereas for the read to if you see the time between the write to and the read to there is a lot of time so if this write to is been successful by the time the read to was made you will get again read after write consistency and you will get the data each 41 so it depends from scenario to scenario the size of the database the latency between transferring the database to different servers these are the two different models now in both the case whether it's a read after write consistency or an eventual consistency aws guarantees that your data will not be corrupted or you will not get partial data aws guarantees that you will always get a complete data or no data if a data successfully is not uploaded then you will might not get a data but if a data is successfully uploaded maybe a different version but you will always get complete data not corrupted data now there are a few of the standard classes available storage classes available the first storage class is standard a standard is a default storage class uh, whenever you create a bucket uh, whenever you try to upload a data this is a default storage class now this has s3 gives you certain properties features like low latency high throughput performance durability availability and it supports SSL encryption. Basically, whenever you are accessing a file on the S3, it is by default contains SSL certificate. Now, there's a concept of lifecycle management. But to understand the lifecycle management, we need to first check out all the storage classes. So this is the standard one, which is the default storage class. Here you will get charged based on the amount of storage that you are storing on Amazon S3 plus the put and the get request you will make to the object. If you are uploading 10 objects, then also you will get charged for the transmission of that 10 objects. And if you are fetching the 10 objects 20 times, then you will get charged 20 times of that 10 object. So here you will get charged for put object, get object, and storing of the object. The second class is the standard infrequent. There are a lot of different subclasses available in the standard infrequent which is designed for long lived data. So if your data accessibility is very infrequent, you use this data once in a while, once in a week or once in a day, when you have a long period of time of accessing the data, then you can go with the standard infrequent. 
Now, when you have a standard infect pen, you will get charged for the storing of your data plus the retrieval data per GB basis. So, if you have upload, if you have uh, you know uh, consuming uh, one GB of data, then you will get charged for the number of GBs of data you have consumed. Again, the same features: low latency, high throughput, durability, availability, SSL, and it also support lifecycle. Now, lifecycle is form standard to infrequent. We'll take one example to understand this lifecycle management. And the third class is reduced redundancy. A redundancy is for non-critical, non-reproducible data like logs, thumbnails, temporary files. For such kind of storage, you can go with the reduced redundancy. It also supports the same features, and you can again move it to the a wire life cycle management and the fourth storage class is the glacier which is completely for infrequently accessed data in this whenever you have a data on the glacier at that time you need to wait for three to four hours to retrieve that data if you request for the data today uh, at this time you will get a data after three to five hours this is the archive data so amazon will take a lot of time to restore the data and can give it to you. You have same features. Now let's just consider one scenario. You are running a job portal. Okay, on your job portal side, whenever a resume is uploaded by a candidate, this resume is been totally is let's say stored is stored on the Amazon S3 standard one. Whether this this person is continuously uh, you know applying for the jobs and a lot of things here and there So this resume is stored on the S3 standard one Which uh, data can be accessible by different HR managers or different uh, he used to apply to different companies Let's say after 30 days or 40 days uh, The job portal side is requesting the user to upload a latest resume or the person has changed the resume and there's a another copy of your data available so what it will do it will again upload the same data it will again upload the resume the latest resume so the latest resume becomes the standard one because the standard because the latest resume will be used continuously now to interact with the different application job application the old resume will not be useful now correct so in that case what you can do is you can move the older copy of your database older copy of your resume from standard to infrequent because as you are running a job portal customer data is very important in any time the user can ask for the uh, the older copy of your of the resume so in that case you need to definitely require to store the data so what you can do is you can easily move the data to the infrequent one and let's say the user is not used that resume for the next 30 days or 60 days whatever the time period you can define if a user is not using the data for the next 30 days 60 days you can move it to the glacier again the customer data is very important so you need to keep but you can put it to the glacier so in the entire case first of all the entire process will be automatic moving from the standard to the infrequent to the glacier Secondly, when you do all this transaction, you are actually saving your cost. The cost of storing the data on a standard one is higher comparatively to the infrequent and the glacier. So as your data is moving automatically to different kinds of storage system, you are actually again saving your cost. So this is one of the great example or the great use case where you can use this S3 for storing your objects. So that is uh, that is you can achieve via life cycle management the life cycle of an object you can define 30 days 60 days 90 days, whatever the period you want and through the life cycle it will be passed from one uh, one storage class to another uh, Lalit, one minute yeah. Lalit, other than this uh, cost implications uh, is there any uh, uh, advantages of using glacier uh, see, apart from this cost, 
the difference of or when you want to use this glacier in, if you are having completely infrequently accessing data you are not using the data for the next three uh, three months four months for a large period of time at that time you should go only for the glacier for frequently accessed data this is not at all recommended because whenever you are trying to access the data it will take three to five hours to restore the data and, and also see uh, the cost is based on something something like whatever you just said like uh, 0 0.04 uh, gb rgb dollars for the point 0.4 dollars yeah almost 0 0.04 dollars uh, per gb yeah per per month right this is for s3 or for only for glacier this is for the glacier for the storage of s3 the uh, the pricing differ from region to region secondly it also depends on the amount of storage you do plus the put request and the get request yes okay it, it involves uh, even getting the uh, the put request and get request also right that cost right 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 So these are the four storage tasks to which you can make a transaction of your life cycle of an object based on the use cases you can define this let's say you can also use uh, for example like a uh, government applications if you are going for Aadhaar card pan card such kind of uh, application whenever you request for such kind of documentation whenever you request for such kind of application Whenever you upload the data, the upload will be made on the standard one because the process, the application will take a lot of time. The users, the govern, the government users will verify your all the documents and everything. So uh, for the next seven days or 15 days, let's say your data will be completely accessible. A user can access to your data whenever he gets time and he can verify your document. So let's say you put your data, all your other card copies, bank card copies, passport copies, whatever it is. On the standard one and once we are let's say the government side guarantees that the, your application will be requested within 7 to 15 days so once it is done the time frame is done once the application has been successfully uh, you know verified or not verified whatever the status will be based on the status you can move it to the infrequent one because once this application has been successfully created once everything is done you don't require the data on the standard one now you can move it to the infrequent one so that you can save your cost and once again it is done for the next 30 days or 60 days you can just put directly to the glacier because customer data is very important and, and when you are running a government site you need to always keep your data of customers data very secure so at that time you can move it to the glacier so it becomes a very good strategy to uh, to uh, to reduce the cost and to actually access the data which is required So with S3, uh, with EC2, we have seen a lot of features. With VPC, we have seen a lot of features. All there are certain features and properties that S3 offers you. Like versioning, you can keep multiple versions of a same file. ABC.txt can contain thousands of versions. So you can upload all the versions and you can keep the versioning of all the files with when you enable this option, versioning. Then we have seen logs on the EC2 section. We have seen logs on the VPC. Now there are logs on the S3. So whatever, whenever person requests for the data on S3, all the in and out transaction will be logged in the login future. Now here comes the website configuration. You can host a static website for free on Amazon S3. Can you tell me what is the difference between static and dynamic website? User interaction is there. Static is a website which is not changed when you are in it. Only for viewing. Only for viewing. Exactly. For the viewing purpose only. For the static content only, you have a static website. So if you have such kind of static website, you can dump all the data on S3 and you can enable this hosting configuration. And you don't need to pay any for hosting purposes. You don't need to pay anything for web servers etc this is completely free web hosting service offered by the s3 only for the static website 
then we have already seen the life cycle management to transfer the data from standard to infrequent to the glacier whatever your transition will be now here comes the transfer acceleration let's assume a scenario like i am sitting in mumbai and my entire infrastructure is created again in mumbai but my customers are situated in us uk and the different parts of the world so when they are uploading huge files on my st bucket it takes a lot of time for them to upload the data because sending the data from us to india will need to connect to different different types of hopes and then it will dump the data to my st bucket so when you enable this transfer acceleration what it will do is it will upload the data to a to its nearest edge location that is your cache location and then from this cache location it will be directly sent to the my region mumbai region where its private dedicated link so the time frame that will be required to directly upload to the mumbai region from a us uk and to upload the data from its own regional location and then send it via aws private link that will be more efficient so if you have that kind of scenario you can enable this transfer acceleration and the user will upload user can upload your data quickly now this will cost you extra whenever you enable this feature it will cost you extra then we have events that is called as push notification anything happen in your st bucket you can just send a notification now there are different kinds of notification that s3 supports first is sns that is simple notification service once uh, like the example that we have taken once an sns once a resume is uploaded you can send a notification to the end user that your your resume has been successfully uploaded you can send an email notification mobile notification and at the same time you can send a notification to the hr team that uh, a person has uploaded a resume which matches your skills and as soon as such kind of actions occur you can send a notification you can also send this uh, events on the sqs to processing of your data to processing of your any kind of files resumes or applications government application you can go with the sqs system and the third service that it supports is lambda let's consider one example whenever you upload a resume on any job portal site as soon as you upload it does some arithmetic calculation it uh, processes into some algorithm and it extracts the data from your resume and show on its own format correct this happens even if you go on linkedin and do such kind of things or whatever the application you are using for job site every time you upload a resume your resume it extracts the data and it matches in its own format like the name will be captured and the name will be written in its own field the skills will be captured and the skills will be written in the skill section whatever the experience you have it will all automatically capture and will write to the uh, qualification and experience properties everywhere so to process all these things you can use the lambda feature lambda is a serverless services through which you can write a code and that will extract the data and do the processing so if you want to do such kind of things whenever user upload the data if you want to extract the data you can send it to sns uh, sorry you can send it to the lambda lambda will process the data and will write it to the dynamo db so again the entire infrastructure becomes serverless because s3 is a serverless dynamo db is serverless lambda is a serverless so the entire configuration entire system can be serverless application so you can process such kind of scenarios so in that case what will happen now a resume can differ from person to person and a system is designed to understand a single or a um, few levels of understanding that to extract the information so let's say you have uploaded a resume which is not recognizable by that lambda function it is beyond the scope of that lambda function so in that case what will happen what are the things what are the uh, properties that it can filter and it can pop out it will write the data to the dynamo db and the rest of the data which it cannot recognize 
like the expert experience or qualification you have mentioned into some columnar wise or some any in any format that is not recognizable by lambda then it will pop up a message for you that please enter the below the fields and you will write again the we will enter the all the fields what are the data that you uploaded on the resume you will now manually upload all the data so in this way you can process everything and make the entire system automatic so that is events whenever anything happen on your s3 you can trigger an event notification then you have cross region replication that is the object will be automatically copied or the entire the object will be automatically replicated to another s3 bucket in another region but there are certain companies like Citibank or other hsbc bank whose data is very important such kind of financial sites so what they do is they enable this cross region replication across different uh, regions and once upload once the data is uploaded to the first bucket the data is automatically got copied to the another bucket in another different region that is cross region replication and then we have request or pay request or pay is something that you are paying for the storing of the data for the put request and the get request whenever you uh, whenever you are using s3 service you do you pay for all the things but when you enable this request or pay option at that time you only pay for the storage and the person who is going to access the data will uh, pay for the get request for the put request and for storing of the object you are the person who is going to pay to the aws for the get request the person who is requesting the data will pay for that object so this is request to pay these are all the features and the properties of s3 let me know if you have any questions Nalip, uh, what is the cross region replication? Uh, something like asynchronous copying of the objects? Yeah, basically, like there are two buckets, one in Mumbai and one in North Virginia, let's say. And the Mumbai uh, bucket is your production bucket. So whenever a user or whenever, what is the data that you are uploading into your Mumbai bucket, that data will be automatically replicated to the North Virginia bucket. So you will maintain two different copies of your data. It's like a backup copy. Okay. Uh, anyhow, it is already storing in the uh, something like whatever you explained in the previous slides. It is going of to be course. replicated in the multiple regions, right? Uh, that will not be replicated in multiple regions. That will be replicated in multiple servers, and that yes, replication will be on Amazon side. You cannot have access to the data on the multiple servers. You will get okay. data only from the AWS side. If your data is lost, then only Amazon will take the backup copy from another server to restore the data. For the rest of the purposes, you cannot have access to the databases. For that, you have a service called cross region replication for the customers. If you want to have a backup copy, you can enable this feature. Okay. Hello? Yeah, any other question? Any doubt? Uh, no doubts. All right. So here we go, our S3 service here. Okay. 
and here you can see our SC service is a global service. SC doesn't require any region selection. But these are the all different kinds of bucket in my AWS. But these buckets are region specific. The one is created in Mumbai, Mumbai. One is created in North Virginia. Again, lot of Mumbai are Mumbai and North Virginia. Now there are different kinds of public and private. Just like our submits, we have public submit, private submit. Similarly, our ST buckets are public and private. Whenever you see it, uh, any question in doubt? Uh, no doubt, so, sir. Let's continue. Yeah, there are a lot of voices coming from your side. That's why no, I'll, I'll, I'll work it. Yeah. So they are uh, just like our submits, public submit, private submit. So here we have different kinds of uh, buckets, public buckets, private buckets, and there are different kinds of restrictions that you can do. Like here you can see objects can be public, which means the bucket is open, the bucket is private still, and the buckets might be the uh, the bucket is private and objects may be public may be private in the second uh, bucket the entire bucket and the entire files inside this bucket is public and here you can see the bucket and objects are not public bucket and object not public which means all the files inside this bucket and entire bucket is completely private and there is a last different type of uh, bucket is error, which means this bucket is not accessible. You have no permission to access this data. If I go inside this, I will get access denied because I am not allowed to access this bucket. So there are different kinds of buckets here available on Amazon S3, which you can also create and restrict a user. Now to create a ST bucket, you just need to click on simply create a bucket. Now uh, here you need to give a unique name. Let's say ISOL Global Training. Now here the name should not be in capital. Here you go and select a region in which region you want to create. Let's get it in Singapore. Now it says copy setting from existing bucket. If you have done any kind of configuration on any bucket, you can configure the setting here. Otherwise, you can click on next. Now here are the certain options. That is, do you want to enable versioning? If so, you can enable this option. Do you want login features? You can enable these features. Next is tags. Now we have seen tags in every AWS service in computing, load balancer, auto scaling, but a small volume snapshot everywhere. But these tags were not chargeable. But S3 service is a global service, so here tags are chargeable. Whatever the tag that you will apply here, that will be chargeable. So before you do anything, make sure uh, whenever you apply a tags, make sure that these tags will be chargeable based on that you should go then you have object level login if you want to do a uh, login at each uh, bucket at each of one of the object you can go for object level login if you want to encrypt the data on your st you can use go for the encryption and here you have object log just like our ec2 we have accidental deletion here we have ST bucket deletion policy. So if you are trying to delete any public files or uh, bucket, then it will give you error message that you cannot delete this. You need to pass the MFA port, then you are allowed to delete. So these are the certain feature which you can enable once the bucket is created also. The only feature that you cannot do is a uh, object log. Object log is the only thing that you will require to do it right now while creation of the bucket. Once you have created this bucket, you are not allowed to enable this future. And then we have here we have the monitoring features to enable the monitoring services on S3. We have monitoring future. 
uh, as of now we are keeping everything default because we have everything we can enable this all the future once the bus kit is created so we'll see one by one thing click on next now these are access control is just like our subnet network access control is here you have an access control is when you have block all the public access it means your files and your buckets are public are not uh, uh sorry your buckets and your files are completely private they are not shared and when you disable this option it means you can change the permission you can change your data you can change uh, the policy who can access and who cannot access so as of now we will go with the blocked one everything default and we can again change the part here next and click on create bucket so here we go your bucket is created and the bucket is also called as buckets and object not public which is the entire bucket is private and all the content inside this uh, file is also private so if i click on this i have various options available i can upload a file i can create a folder there are a lot of things that i can do open download then make public cut copy paste etc if i click on the properties i have again all the features available versioning logins hosting etc permissions the one that we just talked about public access all the four permissions here it is access control list if you want to share this bucket with other aws account if you want to make it public you can do this bucket policies and all these things management policies everything so now let's just create one file let's call this is version one and let me just save on the desktop test.txt file all right this file says this is version one let me just click on upload add file and say test.txt next next and now it asks us in which storage class do you want to enter do you want to upload as a standard do you want to upload as the infrequent do you want to upload as a glacier what exactly the type of you want i will go with the standard one next and upload so basically it's showing me one error because of the Mm. what do you call add blocker because of the ad blocker is saying one error otherwise when you try you will get one successful here the file is also successfully uploaded and here you can see if i click here i have various options to open a file to download download as copy the path and if you see if you want to access this file the location is https which means SSL is already encrypted with this file. It is secured file. And again, on each of these files, you can have different kinds of storage properties, permissions you can define, etc. You can do. Now, I do not have any permission to make this file public. Can you tell me the reason behind it? As the owner of this file and as the owner of this bucket, I still do not have the permission to make this file public. Because bucket itself is in a Yes, so what we need to do is we need to go to the permission, and here this is something that we need to remove. So if I remove this access control list from here, I click on save. Now I can make a file public and check on the browser what it says. So this says this is version one. Now as we haven't enabled the versioning options, now let's just open the versioning. Enable versioning. 
and click on save. Now we'll upload the same file, but this time we'll say this is version 2. Same file upload. Test, this is version 2. Choose and upload. No changes, nothing. And if I now see the latest version here, I have two different versions. One which is uploaded at 5.09.46 and one which is just uploaded at 5.12.02. So when I click on this, make public, click on this file, this is, this is version 2. Now if I want to access the version 1, I can just select this one, click on this, and you will say this is version 1. So at the same time, I can access to any version I want. This is called as versioning. Now you need to make sure before you do on every bucket this version in future you need to make sure that it is actually required. Otherwise this will create multiple copies whenever you synchronize your data with uh, S3 it will have multiple files and all the files will have the number of data. That is currently this file is 17 bytes. So if I continuously add the same file again and again so this file will contain a huge amount of data 17 bytes 34 bytes 1 mb 2 mb 3 mb and here at that time you will get charged for that so at that time you need to make sure that this version is, is allowed for the requested data only the data which is actually required then we have login that is when you enable this login features the data will be dumped uh, uh, whenever the just like your flow log, whatever the data is accessed, the data will be logged here. Now, as for the best practices, you should choose a different bucket within the same region. But as of now, we do not have any other bucket in the same region in the Singapore region. So I'm just showing us one bucket. And uh, I want to dump all the data in my logs folder. Just click on save. And I will what I will do is I will create a log folder so that whatever the data will be uploaded, whatever the logs will be generated will be delivered in my log section. So I can have a separate data for my logs and for my actual data. Then we have static website hosting. I just create another file, simple HTML. And this time let's upload our data file. And now what we'll do is we will just enable this option. Use this bucket to host the site. You need to define your index document. In our case is index.html. In case if this file is not accessible, if you want to show a special message that the website is under maintenance or something, you can define the error.html page and the things will be listed here. Just copy this and click on save. So once you do this and if you refresh the endpoint, you must get the data. But it's saying access denied. Why? What would be the reason why it's still showing us access denied? We have index.html page. We have enabled this feature. Still the data is not accessible. It is not made public. Correct. So just like our EC2 machine, we have EC2 machine, we have web server, we have HTTP port also open, but we need to start the server, right? So we need to make sure the data is public. What we do is click on action and make public. So now if I refresh, 
it says this is static hosting. Now you can dump the entire file also. So this is the entire content of the file. So if you want to upload, what you can do is just click on upload. Select all the files and just drag to the ST console and paste it here. Once you do, now what you can do is click on next and we'll make every file as a public so that we don't need to call, select all the files and do these things. We'll make the objects public. Next next and upload So as you can see here the entire uh, data has been uploaded so if i refresh now we can see here the entire site without creating any ec2 server without running any application we just need to update the data and we can see the entire site here you can use css you can use the javascript for animation purposes and you can make it interactive it supports JavaScript, jQuery, CSS, HTML, X HTML, JSON, CSV, all the static content it supports. All right. Any question in doubt in this part? You uh, mentioned about tax, right? Yeah. Can you just give us an, you know, any uh, example you know, or business case for using that tax? Okay. Tax are basically used. Uh, why we use tax in our EC2 machine? Filter. Right to filter the services which the EC2 machine belongs to production and which belongs to staging. Or uh, what are the different kinds of application we are running? To filter all the services we use tags. So similarly oh. for the also we can use it for filtering purpose. For uh, like uh, you have this resource group here. If you want to create a resource group for all the ST bucket that belongs to production, then you can sort all the site based on the tags. Now S3 is a global service. Whenever you create a bucket that needs to be uniquely identified, so S3 tags are chargeable. There's nothing like the purpose of the tags are same for the EC2 machine for the SC tax purpose are always same. Just EC2 machine is in based on your AWS account and SC is a global service, that's why it's chargeable. And EC2 tags are not chargeable. Okay. All right. And uh, how about uh, storing the video files on uh, S3? Yes, you can upload directly data on the S3. And then whatever the application you are running with, let's say your application is running on EC2 machine. Then you can pull this file EC2 directly. You can just create a rule that EC2 can have access to the S3. So that EC2 application, whatever it's running, will pull the data media file from S3. 
And if you want to upload the videos from the local machine, we have to use the APIs, right? Yeah, you can use the API, CLI, whatever you are comfortable with, you can use. Okay. So just uh, tool to your EC2 machine that you can access the ST service to push and pull the data. Okay. And uh, is the same uh, bucket being used by FSX? Uh, WebSX, yes, WebSX, uh, go to meeting, everyone is using it. Free. No, FSX, uh, those are your, uh, uh, sorry, AWS uh, FSX, right? FSX is not, no, it's different. So that is uh, like uh, another option of Windows Sky Server on cloud. Uh, EFS we have seen EFS is for Linux and for Windows mounting we have VF FSX. Here it is. Okay. All right. Any other question, doubts? Uh, no, Lalit. All right. So sh the rest of the session is a bit long. That it will take a lot of time. So shall we continue or do it uh, next day? Next day. Uh, next day, like uh, the next we are meeting, I think on 21st, right? Second. Second. Um, I think the dates that are shared with me are 21. Weeks. Okay, we'll reach out. Yeah, whatever you think, yeah, let me know. Yeah. Sure, sure. So today we have covered the VPC and S3. Let me know if you have any doubts in our next session. Otherwise, we'll move forward to our S3 and database and the, some basic application services that we have. We'll cover those up. Okay. So, are we, are we good with this today's session? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Yes, very, yes. very uh, innovative and very knowledgeable. Yeah, thanks. But uh, I would say, like, to understand the VPC at the highest level, you need to do a lot of practice. Especially yeah, yeah, yeah. VPC data, how to create a VPC, then submitting part. This is very important. Once you understand this part, you can do any kind of things. Whenever you're interacting with your clients, either some clients will give you VPC and submit range, and most of the time they will just give you VPC range to design the submits and everything. So it's very important to have all these things. All right. So, yeah. All right. Next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.